This is Kimberly Quinn, host of the Minecraft podcast, and I can't tell you how much fun I have had doing this podcast. I, I started when the world closed over the pandemic in, a, in an attempt to spread some positivity out there and give people some strategies to enhance their own well-being and reduce anxiety and all of that. Now, two years later, we're still going strong and now listened to by 52 countries across the world. And I've even helped some of my students get going with their own podcasts. It's super easy to do. And I'll tell you, if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it is the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. I'll just explain for you. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It is a ball. Start today. Greetings, Mindcrafters. And I am just so excited that it's December. I love this month. I'm a winter person, and it's just so deep and contemplative. And uh, anyway, I forgot if I said my name is Kimberly Quinn, and I'm thrilled to be here and have this Minecraft conversation. And today's topic is I'm feeling it today. I'm telling you, listeners, seasonal soulcraft, seasonal soulcraft, because I realize I have listeners are all across the United States and world. And thank you so much for tuning in with us here. Uh, in northern Vermont, however, it is a beautiful champagne snow. Actually, we have a nor'easter coming, but right now it's beautiful champagne snow. And it's just deep and cozy, and I've got the golden retriever here and a fire going in the fireplace. And so this is the great greatest stage for this chat. And so my inspiration is from the, the amazing Sarah Bon Brednick. I'm kind of stuck on her right now. Not stuck on her, inspired by her right now. Um, with her book, Simple Abundance. I just, I love it so much. So this whole topic of seasonal soul craft, I think is obviously deeply spiritual. And she's, Sarah starts out with a quote by Henry David Thoreau, a total fave of mine. And he says, in regarding to seasonal soul, soul craft, live each season as it passes, breathe air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign yourself to the influence of each. Let them be your only diet, drink, and botanical medicines. I love that. It's just, he's like the ultimate mindfulness guy, right? Living in the woods, living the dream, living life, grabbing, having life by the ass, you know, the whole thing. And I don't know, I get, I, it's just winter. Again, I'm a winter person. It just, and also, I also love November. November is very contemplative and reflective as well and just kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come with winter and so sarah starts out by saying the winter air outside is thin and bracing sharp frigid icy stinging we do not saunter the pace of our steps is quick mirroring on the outside the accelerated forward motion within as holiday preparations take center stage once we close the door, the winter air is warm, heavy, and aromatic, wood-burning, fresh evergreens, spicy cinnamon, and ginger. Breathe in deeply the fragrance of contentment. You know, and of course, spirituality rolls through all the seasons, 365 days a year plus leap year. It's just for me, I think late fall, and there's something about late fall and, and then right through December. That's just so deeply spiritual. Maybe it's the solstice, you know, energy change. If you've, if you've listened to George Winston, I, I feel like from November through December, it's just like, I feel like I'm living a George Winston CD. It's just the music and it just moves my spirit. It's deeply reflective, which I guess would be contemplative. And it's just something in the air. And then, so Sarah keeps, uh, keeps us going with, she says, uh, in the winter, we live in anticipation. That's the truth, huh? Friends come in from the cold to be embraced by the convivial chaos of our family's annual holiday open house. All year long, I dream about your homemade eggnog, a guest confides, as soul gifts are exchanged, heartfelt compliments, and a cup of cheer. In the kitchen, frothy hot wassail, I hope I'm saying that right, which is spiced cider and dark English ale. Sounds interesting. 
um, is ladled into cups, ransoming hands and hearts from winter winter's chill. The dining room table groans good-naturedly from the bounty of abundance. Roast turkey, baked ham, cheeses, fresh breads. Children of all ages crowd around seasonal sweets and winter's fruits. Candy canes and sugar plums, plums, pumpkin pies and, and sorry, pumpkin, mints, and apple pies. And of course, um, they've done a, a, a several episodes recently, the past week or two, on you know how the holidays are such a mix. You know, it's it's not to be a Debbie Downer because I, anyone who knows me know what knows what an incurable optimist I am. It's just I'm also an authenticator and a validator, and you know, not everybody has you know a, a Christmas open house and a and a, you know, loving family and not everybody had even has someplace to go necessarily. There are people who don't even have one person in this whole world. And I think it's just important to acknowledge that and not pretend that it's all, you know, it's all eggnog and, and Christmas cookies, you know, and, and, it, and it's also important to also acknowledge the other end of it. You know, like what I just read from Sarah Bon Brednick with the wonderful open house. So it's a big, it's a big mix. And we're talking about seasonal soul craft and and that needs to be so individualized. You know, if you've got some family members, and then there's the whole middle, right? It's not like on one end there's, you know, this, you know, like, you know, airbrushed picture of, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect family. But, you know, surrounding a dining room table and everything's beautiful and beautiful food and abundance everywhere. And then the other side is somebody on the street with, you know, ho- you know without a home, and without people in their lives, and there's a whole middle where there's, you know, you might have, you know, some people in your lives, and you might have some who are toxic, and you know what, and, you know, I don't want to get into my whole backstory here, I just, just for validation purposes, I, some of, some of the reason I've chosen to share my backstory is because I think it, because it's validating, because I lived in the suburbs of New York, as you know, about an hour out of Manhattan, um, in a very regular, you know, three-bedroom uh, ranch, I guess it would be a very modest home in a na- neighborhood that was a lot of fun on Halloween. Uh, but you, I think often dysfunction is not seen or noticed as much from the outside looking in when you are in quote unquote, a regular family, you know, you got the two kids. I just a sister, there's a mother and a father in the house to, you know, and you got the, the one good car, the one used car, and people, you know, people just don't think anything's going on. It, it there tends to be more of a focus on, you know, more overt, you know, uh, situations that often, you know, stereotypically often follow certain demographics and certain income levels and certain neighborhoods and things like that. When in reality, addiction, which I grew up certainly knows, you know, is an equal opportunity employer. Put it that way, you know, both parents with addiction issues and mental illness rampant in the house. And, you know, anybody who grows up with that kind of dysfunction, especially with addiction, but I think even without addiction, you know, you breathe shame, like you breathe oxygen, right? And, you know, shame is the spiritual and emotional equivalent of drinking turpentine for breakfast. And so then, so that's just important to say that, I think, because we've got like the, the I'm thinking the, the Home Alone movie, the house there, my husband loves that house, actually. And it's all nicey, nice, nice until they obviously they had their issues, you know, with the losing the child and leaving him and leaving him and going to France. But leaving that aside, you know, the beautiful colonial house and the banisters and the lights and the tree in each room or, you know, the and the beautiful dining room table and all the family. And it's just important to realize that addiction, dysfunction, homes, the whole middle area, may you may have had some love, but not all the love you have needed. Ba 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 ba. So we're talking about soul crafting. I'm talking about being all inclusive. You could be, you know, a person who grew up in the one percent, you know, and were completely emotionally deprived and love starved. And then this video is for you too, you know. And it's what's hard with that is people often don't have empathy for people who are financially wealthy and who are struggling with depression or like, what's the matter? Suck it up, Buttercup. And in Minecraft 2 that I, I was teaching for a while, and it's just sometimes they, they bring them in and out based on need. And I had an article in there about millionaires, or even millionaires get depression, even have depression. I don't know. I'm not looking at it, so I might have paraphrased it a bit, and I'm not quoting it exactly, but 
to me, depression's depression. And, and if somebody is in despair, which the next step is often taking your life, that's worth focusing on and paying attention to. So the idea here with soul craft is to include everybody, to include the person on the street who doesn't have anyone, the person who is in, you know, middle America, who's there's all kinds of stuff going on behind their closed doors that nobody can see or notice. And then you've got the 1% who maybe, you know, mom's taking Valiums every day just to survive her life because she hates her life and you're taking whatever to hate her life. Or she's got a big, you know, big jug of gray goose under this front seat in the minivan or the Mercedes, if we're talking about the 1%, right? And she's still dying a slow death. You know, it all matters. And so um, I took a little detour there on purpose. And then it's because, and then there's all the positive stuff, right? There's all the winter fruits and candy canes and sugar plums and all the Christmas specials and all that. And then Sarah says, souls, sip and savor. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry in the season of joy. And so what we're saying with including everybody, that needs to be crafted in the way that's realistic for your life, right? Realistic for your soul craft and do something good for yourself on Christmas Day, on Hanukkah, on the day before Christmas, whatever day it is, if you just, if it's just hard for you, you're walking, maybe you live in an urban area and you're just, you're just overwhelmed by social comparison because you can't help it. You're sitting on Fifth Avenue, New York, and Gucci bags are walking back and forth and back and forth. And it's hard not to notice that. People getting out of limos to go to Broadway shows and things like that. So it means to do your very best to not do that, do your very best and to soul craft something that's for you that's realistic. If that's, you know, a, a cup of hot cocoa that's fancy, if that's taking time out for yourself, if it's a nice walk away from everything, if it's just indulging in a book, if it's spending, you know, two hours with a friend and going to get a burger, anything, whatever works, whatever works to, to really love and take care of yourself during the holiday season. And then uh, Sarah says, uh, the most ancient spiritual wisdom was centered around the predictable shifts in season, seasonal energies. I think we were just saying that, right? Like me walking around feeling like I'm residing in George Winston's CD, you know? Um, rituals revolved around sowing, reaping, and the cycles of light and darkness. Joan Boryshenko, the respected scientist, gifted therapist, and unabashed mystic, reminds us in her tiny contemplative jewel, this is her little book, pocket full of miracles, prayers, meditations, and affirmations to nurture your spirit every day of the year. The seasonal rhythms correlate with our bodily rhythms, our dream life, and our inner life grow more insistent in the winter darkness. The old year is put to bed, one's business is finished, and the harvest of spiritual maturity is reaped as wisdom and forgiveness. I love that. I think it's Oprah who says wounds to wisdom. And, we, you know, what it comes down to is nurturing ourselves. And the only way we can get to that place, which I've said in loads of videos, is to come into this place of knowing our own value. We have to, we have to know our value in order to feel like we deserve to be treated well and to treat ourselves well and to attract other people treating us well. Not, I don't mean attract as romantic. It can be that too. But I mean attract anybody, the person who bumps into you in the grocery store. We attract kindness and, and we attract more kindness, more goodness, more positivity when we know our own value because we put it out there that we expect it. We expect it. We don't say it. It just We just exude it. It leaks out of our pores like sweat after you run a race. You're just sort of sweating self-value. Well, I tell you, especially in, you know, midlife, the authentic path, this authentic journey that we are on here is largely about wisdom and forgiveness. And wisdom is, is life school, right? You know, we can have 17 PhDs, but, you know, wisdom is earned by, by walking the walk. You know, that's just how it is. In fact, a good friend of mine, Dr. Liz, Lindsay uh, Godwin, she's amazing. What a hot ticket she is. She just did a great Psychology Today article, by the way, and it's about experiential intelligence. You know, we talk about uh, the IQ and also emotional intelligence, and I'm just putting this out there because it's relative to what we're talking about. And now, you know, we're sort of giving credit. Like, who are we to give credit to anybody? I don't mean it like that. I, I get not acknowledging. That's what I'm saying. 
acknowledging the experiential intelligence that we acquire through our life experiences. So basically, the PhD in life is what her article is about. So that's Dr. Lindsay Godwin, Psychology Today. All right, so then uh, Sarah continues. <clears throat> For centuries, Eastern healers, particularly practitioners of Chinese medicine, have taken into consideration the, Im the impact the seasons have on our bodies, minds, and souls. But the symbiotic relationship between human beings and nature has virtually been ignored by Western medicine until recently. Okay, and then she says, <clears throat> I really like that. Now physicians acknowledge that some people suffer from a deep depression in the winter because they're extremely sensitive to darkness. Light therapy restores their subtle energies to a healthier balance. I'll tell you, I know for a fact I've seen this where I teach at the wonderful Champlain College that, because my students are super vocal, we've got students who are um, unique, I guess is the best way to say it. They really, mark, they dance to their own, dance, dance to their own beat, you know, totally. And they're super open about, you know, and during class, you know, the, you know, the darkness is really, granted we're in Northern Vermont, you know, the, the light, the darkness is really tough for me, seasonal affective stuff. And sometimes they're not even diagnosed, but they're just, they'll say to me, I'm sorry, this took me a little longer. You know, I, I dipped into a slump, you know, like mid, you know, end of February or March or something like that. And we talk about strategies to prevent that, which is mainly to embrace the winter, honestly. Um, but it's, but the point is that we are aware of it and, and sensitive to it and flexible with it because it's real. It's definitely real. Um, and then Sarah goes on to say, uh, learning the soul craft of seasonal healing can bring new depth to our journey toward wholeness. In the natural world, winter is the season of rest, restoration, and reflection. Man, I, winter is such a badass too. Like I just know she's a, a, a seasoned midlife female. There's no question. Winter, I said this in another episode, I, I think. And it, also I read a, a New Yorker, uh, there was an article in the New Yorker years ago, and I wish I kept it. I mean like 20 years ago. I wish I kept it, but winter is such a badass. She's like, she's the queen of all the seasons and she chooses to allow them to happen when she, when she darn well feels like it. So winter just decides when she allows spring to do her thing. And I, I know that in Northern Vermont, because winter sometimes does this little like poker bluff where she's kind of playing with the other with spring and says, okay, I'll let you. And there's like a week of sunny, rather warm weather and the daffodils start to get excited. And then, she snows. Sometimes it's big snow. Sometimes, and it's usually at that time of year, heavy, wet snow. And their sad little daffodil heads are just sort of kowtowing to winter as the, as the uh, mama mob boss that she is. So um, where was I going with that? Hold on. All right. I got it. Now I lost my train. I got wrapped up in winter being a badass. So, I mean, the wholeness, or sorry, in the natural world, world winter's a season of rest, restoration, reflection. I, I was just out this morning with little Giovanni in the woods in a nor'easter. It was like had a little dip in it, and it's coming back again in a couple of hours. But it was absolutely intoxicating. The, what a winter wonderland. It was, It was. oh, just beautiful champagne snow, which then got heavier and heavier and heavier. So we went into the woods a little more because I was making a video, and the brook and the snow and it's just so white and so clean and so fresh and it just feels new and the newness around me had me feeling new on the inside I and mean, this is it's all metaphorical but it's also when I was when I was out in the woods it wasn't it wasn't just metaphorical it was real I mean it feels restful restorative and rejuvenating there's just no question it's so reflective and then Sarah says um there's not much of that going on this week. She's talking about the holidays. But after the holidays are behind us, well, it is for me because I'm not letting the holidays take over. And I'm not trying to be that person on a soapbox. I'm just walking the talk. I disappeared this morning in a nor'easter to step out of the holiday current. Okay, continuing now. And then she said, but after the holidays are behind us, consider how you spend whatever time you have at your personal disposal. And if you have as little as I think you do, reflect on how you can change that for next year. Oh my gosh. I just I'm reading this now, but I actually did a thing on this this morning without even reading this. Because there is no law that says we have to get swept up in the holiday current like a piece of driftwood. You know, we can we can step off off of that escalator. We can step out of the current of the of the fast moving brook and just know we can slow it down. It doesn't have to be a screeching halt, but we can slow it down by choice. 
you know, unplug the drug, which I mean, the, you know, the cell phone. Or get out physically, get out of Dodge, head for the woods. If you're in a big city, head for whatever the equivalent of Central Park is in your city. If worse or worst case scenario or last, you know, resort, dive into a bathroom. No one's gonna bother you there, and just step out of the current. So then she ends up, she winds it up with saying, the 12th century German mystic Hildegard of Bingen. I hope I said that right. Suggests a simple way for us to begin exploring the richness of seasonal soul craft. Here we go. Glance at the sun. See the moon and the stars. Gaze at the beauty of earth, earth greenings. Now, think. I love that. So I wish you all a season of soul crafting. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful northern Vermont in a nor'easter. It is beautiful. Have a mindful day.